Welcome to another episode of Cultivate. This is a show about you and your journey in the cannabis industry. It's moving fast, but there's room for everyone. Buckle up as we bring you the people and the technology that are blazing the trail. Welcome to Cultivate. We are really excited today because in honor of International Women's Day, we have a full guest list of strong females in the industry and a full uh, lineup of hosts at Bovida that are all females as well. Uh, my name is Kate, and I'm here with my co-hosts. Hi, I'm Danny Lisa Rosso. I'm the California and International Sales Coordinator at Bovida. And I'm Rochelle Gordon, cannabis copywriter and journalist in the space. Well, our first guest today is... Emily Real, and she has a great story of bun t- bud tender to national sales manager story. So welcome to the podcast, Emily. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me today. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, we're thrilled to have you too. And we love seeing that Bovida blue in the background. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. You have to thank my husband. He just painted. I was going for the Princess Peach Castle look. <laughs> love it. <laughs> Perfect. Love it. <laughs> well, Emily, we'd start like to start just by hearing your story of how you entered the cannabis industry and kind of your experience as a female in the space. Yeah, for sure. So I'll start off, like you mentioned, I was lucky enough to join at legalization and work on a work at a dispensary and work on, you know, the ground floor and the level rate at the beginning. Um, From there, you know, I learned a lot about different brands, licensed producers, the way they grow, the things they care about and why they're here. During that process, I was able to find a couple LPs that stood out to me, and I joined one of them right away in September of 2019, so almost one full year after legalization here. Um, So I started as a territory sales rep. I managed about 75 retail locations out in Alberta, Canada. Following about five months of that, I was promoted to the key accounts representative. So what that meant was I was responsible for all of the retail communications across Canada um, with the retail buyers of the Fire and Flowers, Novas, the big chains. Um, But I also was still in control of all of the retail communication in Alberta, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, the Yukon and Northwest Territories. So during that, you know, first six to eight months of my Xenobis time, I was able to visit more than 580 retail locations on paper, which is fantastic. It's amazing. (laughs) Yeah, it was wild. So then following that, um, four months later, I was promoted to regional sales manager. And so I started taking on some provincial board communication as well as managing the rest of the sales team out in market. So I was able to build that out Um, and that was going extremely well. So then as of November of 2020, I was promoted to national sales manager at Zenibus. And so what that means is I'm in control of all packages that are sent out across Canada in the recreational market, but also involved in all of the white label relationships and a lot of the shoppers drug mart and medical portfolio that's it wow (laughs) that's all you have for us all that in a year (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah so 14 months it took me to go from you know a bud tender to a national sales manager i think that's the most exciting part of this business and why a lot of us get into cannabis is the opportunity for growth and to learn and so i definitely got what i looked for (laughs) so what um you know i think the bud tender experience is really important just to you know, develop a love and an understanding of the plant and the the consumers at the end of the day. So what, um, you know, do you think was the most important about that role that helped you get where you are today? That's a really interesting question. And it's funny that we're here talking about Bobita right now. And um, the thing I learned most about being on the ground is trying to level with our consumers you know a lot of us in the industry who've been here for a while are you know amped up on cannabinoids and the entourage effect in terpenes but what we often forget is that consumers are very much in kindergarten they haven't quite made it to grade one and they're not really looking for that information yet so while i was a bud tender trying to communicate terpenes and their effects was very complex and so when i bring it back to kindergarten how do we engage with kindergartners. It's often through stories, metaphors, and things like that. So the thing I would say I learned most importantly was communicating terpenes. And how I like to do that is I describe our bodies as a vehicle. So our endocannabinoid system is the car that we're going shopping for. When you walk into a shop, um, an auto shop, you're not going in and saying, 
at least I'm not. Some people might be, but it's very rare where you go in and you're like, what's the highest horsepower you got? That's what I'm leaving with. Um, we usually go in and we're saying, you know, I want a little bit of horsepower. I need to get where I'm going, but I want to have the leather seats, the sunroof, all of those different aspects are what makes your vehicle go from the minivan to a Cadillac. And that's the this same. Is so with awesome. Our- <laughs> I'm stealing this. <laughs> and that's the same with our bodies and terpenes, right? And all the other fun things, the entourage effect. And so when we think about our bodies as vehicles, the gas pedal is our THC but everything else comes from the entourage effect. And so that was what I learned the most, I guess, is figuring out how to communicate that with consumers and make it resonate with them where they understood. It's awesome. (laughs) Great great (laughs) analogy. I love the, I love the gas uh, and cannabinoids uh, analogy. And I've heard that the terps, the terpenes then are the GPS system that guide you where you go. I think that's, Ooh, <laughs> I think that's where they fit yeah. in. <laughs> I like that. That's awesome. Yeah, I think exactly. We could develop this analogy into a, you know, something huge for sure. <laughs> yeah. but, but I think it's a really good point. Cause I think so many people, all they hear about is THC. And can you imagine, you know, just the bad experiences that can come out of that if you're not, you know, educated to the whole system and how it works. So mm-hmm. thank you for that. Of course. So true. (laughs) That's awesome. Um, So with Boveda, you know, us in the industry, I will never forget my first time learning about Boveda. I was working at a dispensary with a gentleman who was a semi-pro wakeboarder from California in the summers. And he came back and he had this, we had this sample of cannabis sitting in our sniff jars and it was decrepit at best. Like it was horrible. <laughs> and uh, he took a boveda and put it in a ceramic jar with a wooden sealed lid. And he brought it back to us three days later. And it was like, he just picked it off the plant. It was so beautiful. It was one of the craziest things I've ever seen. Just bounced it back to life. Totally back to life. <laughs> like we were ready to have a funeral for this, bud. <laughs> and then it came right back. It was fantastic. That. So, yeah, that was my first experience with Boveda and seeing how well it worked. It was awesome. Well, we're thrilled to know you and, you know, continue working with you for sure. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, specific to your, um, you know, you're being a female in this industry. Is there, have you seen that specifically impact your career path or, you know, provided any specific challenges? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, being a young woman in cannabis, there's a lot of uh, negativity, I guess, around some of the younger people. Um, For example, I've gone to stores before, had meetings with people, and they often say to me, you don't look like a cannabis consumer. There's no way you know what you're talking about. Um, You know, we receive lots of sexist comments, lots of pushback. You know, I've been in meetings where people will hear me say one thing and then my male coworker will say the same thing and they'll agree with him but they disagreed with me just yeah, a moment they don't before. listen to us yes <laughs> yeah um but you know in cannabis there's a lot of really open-minded gentlemen here as well like i've been very lucky with the opportunities i have um but yeah there's definitely hurdles in place and we have lots of room to improve but i've seen lots of female you know companies coming forward now within this space and completely female female owned businesses and so that's going to be really exciting for our space as well great what is um emily can you tell us a little bit about what is your favorite part about working in cannabis i would say my favorite thing right now is All of us follow the same mentality, and I've heard this a few times throughout the industry, is all boats rise together. Yes. Not one of us is going to be successful without the other. So there's a lot of times where I'll hop on the phone with competition, and, you know, I've seen them have a post up and looking for a sales rep. I'll call them and ask them, you know, what is it you're looking for in a sales rep? And I'll start recommending some of my connections. Um, It's really important here that we all think about it, like, we work for the industry the people that you know employ us are just the names on our business cards and whatever we can do to support each other is fantastic and from the linkedin community and everything else that i see out there it seems like all of us are on board that way and everybody's lifting each other up looking for opportunities to you know push each other forward and so i would say that's my favorite part is everybody Mm -hmm. feels like a team even if they're employed by someone else That's a great point, because I think, you know, we have no sense of where this industry is going. And instead of trying to, you know, take our little share of it right now, 
you know, just trying to build the industry overall is absolutely a great goal for us all to keep in mind every day when we go to work. Yes, entirely. Yeah, that's definitely what keeps me going is like instead of being all competitive with each other and seeing who's better is just relying on this amazing support that we have and that we're all here for the flower and for the plant and we all work in this industry. So that definitely is like my motivation every day. Yeah, exactly. And I love that you can hop on LinkedIn and ask questions. Or you can hop into, you know, whatever platform you're using, Clubhouse, whatever, and just be honest and like, hey, I want to change this about the industry and I don't know where to start. And then people just start hopping on and giving you, you know, step one through five and it's <laughs> fantastic. So we can obviously make changes as a group. It's funny, I've just recently really invested a little bit more in my LinkedIn, you know, profile and presence. And it's been amazing in a short time, the the quality and, you know, breadth of co contacts that I've made from, you know, all around the world, all different types of businesses. It's such a great place to go for learning, certainly. Definitely. Haven't really dug into Clubhouse that much yet, though, but I've heard good things. <laughs> yeah, I haven't either. It looks awesome, though, from what I saw. I, it's cool because you get notifications whenever people are talking about something. And so I've had conversations about like cannabis packaging all the way to market branding. You can literally learn about anything from anyone on there. And it's nice because I find in other industries when there's someone who owns that much knowledge, they keep it to themselves. But here in cannabis, it's so often that these people are just like, someone pick my brain. I want this to be better. Let me help you. Mm. <laughs> so it's great. I love that part about Clubhouse for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm really enjoying it. I hope that we can all get into a room sometime on Clubhouse. That would be yeah. great. You guys should start a Boveda room. That'd be a blast. Yes. I think a Boveda room. I think maybe a women in cannabis room. There's a lot of different ways that we can, <laughs> that we can do yeah. International, especially we've got, you know, international team here at Boveda mm -hmm. and we've got Canada there. So I think it could be a bit good party. Exactly. Awesome. Emily, talking about Clubhouse and having a room where women in the cannabis industry um, can converse, can you tell us a little bit about maybe one or two women that you admire in the cannabis space? Yes, for sure. So I would say right now, my one of my favorites that I look up to is Jessica, Jessica McCann. Mm -hmm. um, she's about my age and she was working for a licensed producer and recently left to start her own business. And now she's running, it's called Other People's Pot. And it's like a female, um, non-gender specific support group, but it also works with different LPs to bring their brands to life and connect with retailers. And I think, you know, she's fantastic. She's, you know, blazing the way for all things in my opinion <laughs> and then as for a second one i would probably bring up her name is jamie i'll be honest i'll butcher her last name if i even try <laughs> it <laughs> but um she runs a program called the high buds club here in canada and so what she does is it's it's a unique program because she doesn't work for a licensed producer. So she has a little bit more leeway when it comes to connecting with bud tenders. Us in the industry, you know, we have to be careful with what we say and what yes, we sure. share with them to share with consumers. We're not allowed to talk medical. There's a lot of different things. But because she's not a licensed producer, she's able to share a bit more information and engage with them in a completely different way. And so she partners with licensed producers to help them educate bud tenders. Okay. And as we all know, the bud tenders are the key this industry we can act mm -hmm. like you know everybody up in the top knows what they're doing but the bud tenders are the ones who get to pick the brains of consumers every day and they they truly understand what a consumer is asking for and us i can say you know as a, the ranks get higher and higher and higher sometimes we forget that and so having jamie there to you know bring that bud tender feedback right back up to the faces of all of us is extremely important absolutely well, Emily, we thank you so much for coming on today and telling your story and also using the platform as an opportunity to celebrate other women that you admire in the industry. As you said, you know, all ships rise together. So we're just thrilled to be on this journey. Um, before we close, if people are interested in connecting with you, is there a, you know, a specific way that they can reach out to you? Yeah, I am one of those weirdos who only uses LinkedIn. I'm not an Instagram gal. So feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, just at my regular name, Emily Real. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Emily. Thanks so much for having me.
And now we have on the show Nicole Ross. Nicole, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Ooh, and I am so excited to be talking to a bunch of women on the show today. Oh, yes. <laughs> so yes. All right. So, Nicole, tell us a little bit about how you got started in the cannabis industry. All right. It seems like a long winded story, but I'm going to make this as quick as possible. <laughs> so I started in the cannabis industry back in 2013, 2014, where um, I was at the time living in Los Angeles, California. Um, being from Ohio, um, cannabis wasn't something that I was very exposed to, especially um, amongst my family, because we weren't really we weren't consumers. So it was not really consumers. We weren't consumers at all. And I weren't I wasn't around the crowds that actually consumed cannabis at that time because um, there was a stigma associated, especially in Ohio. If you use, utilize cannabis, it was like you're heading towards the gateway of other things. So it wasn't something that was very exposed here. Um, but being out in California where the culture is a lot different and being with the um, recreational program since in the 90s, it was just a different environment being a part of cannabis out there. So I got involved with um, Chef Andrea Drummer, who um, has opened up the first cannabis restaurant in Los Angeles, California, and another partner of I, we decided, we decided to start a cannabis company called Elevation VIP um, because we wanted to be able to look at high-end dining and infuse edibles in a different way than what has been consumed in the prior time. Oh, wow. So um, it was something that was very different at the time when we were actually doing our events for patients and consumers um, because people weren't really aware on microdosing and how to actually infuse meals from that um, consumption perspective. I mean, people were fusing foods for a very long time in their personal setting, but really understanding how to microdose um, for patients in a larger crowd in a larger setting was something that we had to get adjusted to. Um, so I started back in 2014 as the marketing director and owner of Elevation VIP and working with different companies to be able to partner Chef Andrea to different relationships and to be able to establish a brand um, that will resonate for the edible community. Um, from that time, I actually transitioned back to Ohio where I was doing a lot of different marketing for my father's company as well, um, where I came back home to, at first I thought it was gonna be a temporary situation, <laughs> but I kind of got moved Ohio permanently for a little bit. I had my daughter um, at that time. So I was just like, I can't raise a child in California and try to start this <laughs> cannabis company and do all these other things. So I need to kind of, Stay local and do everything from an online perspective. So I kind of preliminarily was working virtually um, with the Elevation VIP in California here in Ohio. And during that time, um, my father has been in the automotive industry for a little over 30 years. And we had an opportunity to um, cultivate here in the state of Ohio for the Ohio Medical Marijuana Control Program. So people were asking to buy our facility um, to cultivate. So instead of us Going and hit, going against the grain and saying, you know, we'll sell our building to somebody else who wants to be a part of the space. What will it take to actually build a team to put an application together here in Ohio? And at the time, I didn't realize all this, all the lengths and all the things that it would take <laughs> to actually get to this point, um, because it was in 2018 when we actually applied for that. No, 2017 is when we applied for the application. It's 2021, so. There's a lot of time that has been passed, but that's pretty much where I got my start from. I transitioned from California doing Elevation VIP uh, with Chef Andrea Drummer, and then I moved over here to be able to start our own company um, with my family, which is family owned and also minority owned and women ran. So it's just been a great transition to just see the development of the cannabis space evolve, but also be a part of this evolving nature here in Ohio is really what I'm excited about because we need some support here. It's a lot of things that is going to be changing in the cannabis industry, but Ohio is um, getting on its legs, getting on its feet. Yeah, we can understand that. You know, as a Minnesota based company, we're a little bit removed from, you know, all of the change that's happened in California and just all over the West Coast and Colorado. So we understand, but I think that is is a pretty cool, you know, testament to you being a trailblazer. I also, when you mentioned microdosing, it's so popular and so hot right now that if you were doing that that many years ago, you know, you definitely have an eye on on what's to come. So yeah. we celebrate that in you, certainly. Thank you so much. And now we get to we get to actually make medicines that we can um, microdose and give patients here, you know, so not trying to figure it out in the kitchen. We can do it on a large scale and create, you know, edibles and bake pens and production because we own a processing lab. So it's a processing facility. So now we can make it in large consumptions um, and we're excited to be a part of this process. A lot different. <laughs> a lot different. <laughs> no doubt. 
lot has changed. So Nicole and I actually yes. had the opportunity to meet uh, back in Spanibus in, I think, 2018. So it's amazing yes. to see what you've done since then. I know a lot of it is waiting, <laughs> you know, waiting on <laughs> government. But and tell pandemic. us a little bit more about that. Yeah, tell us a little bit more about the last two years and what were the, mm-hmm. you know, the biggest challenges, you know, how it either aligns with what you expected or is completely different. Um, well, number one, we're in a federally illegal industry. So the challenges seems to be extra because not only do you have the challenges of being able to raise enough capital to support this industry, but to also know that you don't have the support that you can just walk to a bank and go ahead and say, let me go ahead and get out a loan for a million dollars to start up a medical marijuana lab. Um, Especially when you're talking about a limited license state, you know, these state programs, they build it for only a certain amount of people to be able to have access into the actual industry. And one thing that was important to us is making sure that we don't keep continue to perpetuate the same cycles of just standard culture and business. Um, we did raise capital, but we raised it through family and friends and we raised over two and a half million dollars. So that was something that was very important to me when it comes down to social equity, because yeah. being a minority in this space, uh, one thing I recognize, even just being out at, you know, the ICB or the International Cannabis Conference, it was not many women and it's not yeah. many minorities in the space. And we know that cannabis is something that is a, a multidimensional plant that can help and support anybody. Um, so what I wanted to see and get involved here in the cannabis space is making sure that the opportunities wasn't going to be about just how big your check is to be able to sign, but are you really going to align with our mission and our values to be able to support yes. the communities that have really been disadvantaged in this space? Um, so being able to raise that type of capital um, in the industry that is, you know, you can't just say, oh, okay, I need $10,000. And for some people, $10,000 is a lot of money and a lot of things that you can do with that and knowing that even just to apply, that was a non-refundable fee of $10,000. It was, wow. it was a stretch, you know, so that was non-refundable um, in the program. But then also, too, to be a part of an industry that um, had a set aside and was taken away based off of um, the laws that were written at the time, because in the Ohio program, um, there were only 40 processors that could win a license. And there was over 100 that applied um, for cultivation. There was only, um, I, I believe, a couple, couple hundred people that applied for a level one and level two and only 30 out of a couple hundred people. So the stakes are high and the, the cost is high. So mm-hmm. the challenges that we had to face was more so how do we, number one, write an application that's going to compete with some of these MSOs that's out here in the market? How do we compete when you have to have a capital infrastructure that's going to take a lot to be able to even just get started? Because most startups, you know, it takes three to five years to sustain any type of build out process. Um, and then not to mention all the unknowns. We had 19 tornadoes <laughs> that hit Dayton, Ohio in oh, 2019 wow. that hit right through our neighborhoods. Um, oh. And then the 2020, we had the pandemic. Yes. <laughs> so there has been a lot of challenges. But the one thing that I learned in these challenges is to be able to surrender and to have patience and to learn that, you know, every step of the way is a progress moving forward. And don't worry about what everybody's doing around you. Just focus on what you got to do to get ahead. So. Um, And we have been doing so with a tremendous team of people who've been dedicating their time and energy um, and then just their dedication to the work that we're that is ahead of us. We're excited to be a part of this industry. So um, I have a dynamic group of people who I'm working with. My family, number one, is, you know, again, has been so supportive in this process. We went from parents who never consumed cannabis and now being <laughs> cannabis owners. <laughs> that's such a cool Love story, that. though. Come so on, that's great. It's amazing to see the transformations happen um, through all the processes and how it has supported and helped so many people in this time. And we're looking to be able to push this forward as we continue to move in the next in this next year. That's great. I think, you know, you said uh, patience and perseverance and, you know, just a dedication to you know, living out your own vision and not worrying about what other people are doing. And I think that's just great wisdom that all of us can leave this conversation with. So thank you so much for sharing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so it's been exciting, um, especially when you're talking about a family owned company. You know, um, a lot of people haven't <laughs> don't really do well with this. Yeah. With family. So to know that our community and our family has been such a support system and the reason why this is here for us today is, is because of the community and because of the people who are working with us. And um, 
we're excited to be a part of the industry. We just received our certificate of operation February 3rd of 2021. So Ooh, now we are officially official. I can I can wear a badge. Yes. yes. Officially yes. official. <laughs> hey <-o. laughs> Um, And really now be able to look at, you know, medicines and say, hey, um, our products can be on dispensary shelves. There's going to be about um, six, about 57 dispensaries in the state of Ohio. And we get to have access to all 57 dispensaries um, making different type of products. Um, we're going to start off with a line of vape pens. Um, and we're going to do some dabble, some concentrates. And then we're going to start expanding into the edible market starting late spring, early summer. So a lot of, a lot of exciting things that we're going to be working towards. Being in a market that, you know, cannabis is relatively new. Um, mm -hmm. Is there, you know, going to be a focus on education or how do you, you know, in, I guess, plan to approach a market that is not mature like California? Oh, man, it's a, <laughs> it's, it's a, that's a complex question. Um, we have a state that is about 11 million. Um, and in this market to date, we have about 140,000 patients. Um, because there is a stigma here in Ohio and you're still transitioning off of people who are so used to pharmaceutical drugs. You know, mm -hmm. opioid is something that's really um, big here in Ohio. And we want to make sure that the medicines that we create are going to always be consistent in quality um, because education is so important. There's some limitations of what we had to do. Like you can't really get, you know, a standard um laboratory to go out and just do marketing to any type of patients in, in most industry. But here in Ohio, we are restricted on how we can advertise um, because we're looking, we're a medicinal market. We're not in a recreational base where cannabis mm -hmm. is so fluidly talked about or discussed, or you could just walk to the store next door and say, okay, yes, um, I can let me go just pick up this gram of cannabis and go home. <laughs> no, you have to go through a very substantial process. And it's very important that people shift the mentality of what we see cannabis as as a drug and then going into the medicine idealism so really focusing on cannabis as a medicine and really how does it affect our endocannabinoid system how does the entourage and terpenes really um, change the way we look at the thc profiles versus the cbd profile so the science behind what's taking place is really what i'm excited to start learning and getting more delved in because we get to be behind the science of cannabis with us having the laboratory so that's what I'm excited to do because patients now get to see, okay, we're not just selling something to you for, you know, just pain relief. We want to focus on well-being completely. We want to focus on the mental well-being, the spiritual, the financial, yes. and, the, and the physical well-being of what cannabis can provide. Because we know it can provide so much more than just what we know today. And um, education is going to be the key component. Uh, my team, I have a whole bunch of nurses on my team. Our staff, my mother's our outreach director. I have, a, you know... A sister who's a nurse and then I have a, young, a younger sister who's our administrative director um, for our operation side for our qualities but education is our key um, component yes we know laws are going to change over time so we want to be a part of those changing of the laws especially when it comes down it's to brilliant. Them, have different um, elements you know to be approved for patient base so we're it's a lot of work to begin we're just at the beginning of everything like we thought that we were at the beginning three years <laughs> <laughs> But this is the real this start. This is the beginning of the, the journey. The starting line keeps moving, right? <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you reach one, exactly. there's another one. But. For sure, for sure. But we're here all the way. We're here all the way through the process. And we want to just align ourselves with those who have the same vision and the same dedication to what we're trying to um, express in the community with patients and just our stakeholders. Because even though you might not be a patient, um, being in your community, you're a part of this community. So yes. we're really excited to just express who we are and to learn from other people so we can be accountable for what we're doing in the process. That's great. That's amazing. Nicole, I wanted to touch the topic of being a woman in the industry, in the cannabis industry. <laughs> um, could you tell us about a few um, challenges of being a woman in the cannabis industry and how you've overcome some of those challenges? It's not often that you see a lot of us in any industry yeah <laughs> it, yeah let because... alone the cannabis you know but as you know as you all know ladies you know i think it takes a lot of confidence in stepping into your own power to recognize yes. your worth in any room um and that's what i had to take time to do is to understand that i can sit at any table that i believe i yes. can sit at and knowing that i can bring other women along because when you actually when you look at our team 
we're probably 80% women. <laughs> yes, I love to hear that. That we're is not common. You know, it, it, and it's so funny because our, so our security are like, all oh, these beautiful women in here. All oh, these, oh, these beautiful women. I'm like, ain't that right? You know, just because <laughs> love we that. do have a culture where it's ran by, fem- by feminine energy, you know, and I'm excited because what is this plant? You know, let's be honest. Like, we, let's get really get into some education, you know, over time, you know, when we really start to understand that, um, you know, the challenges that we create amongst co- corporate structures is not changing the way we do things of the past. So for me, you know, I wanted to see a diverse team and I had to yeah. stop saying like, we need to be diverse. We are diverse, you know, because we are in this space to for diversity. So we're not something, it's not something that we have to attain. It's something that we are because of the team that we have in front of us, you know, so really changing the narrative and understanding how to control our narrative of what we're doing and why we're doing it is important for, to me as a woman in the cannabis space, because I don't want people to diminish, you know, my work just because I'm a woman. No, I can handle any responsibility that you have. I am a single mother and I know. You can wear any hat, girl. You know, Mm -hmm. so um, to be able to step into this arena, it just gave me confidence because it's, it's like, number one, you really just don't have women in CEO or C level positions, and versus even not just CEO or C level positions, just in a lot of um, decision making positions as it speaks. So yeah. I want to be able to cultivate and work with um, people who are looking into merging into this market who might not have the technical um, skill set, but can learn and can grow, even if you're male or female in this space. But really cultivating women specifically because I think you you really see like just uh, you know. Um, a master or you a lead tech in um, just any of the space. So just getting there. We're, we're, get, we're, get, <laughs> we're just getting to the market. But now that we're here, we're excited to be able to see the potential that we have at the tables that we sit with. So, and people are supportive. You know, we got a female vice president. We got a lot of things taking place. Ladies are doing some of the tremendous things. And just talking to you three beautiful women right here just gives me hope to know that we can really exceed and do some amazing things in the future. Nicole, I think what you said about confidence is super important because we all feel a little bit more confident just being in this room and being in your presence. So thank you for sharing that with us today. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and just know that, you know, the Bovida team is here. We're excited today to be supporting women and you are a strong you know, smart woman of color who is doing great things to change this industry. So Thank please you. let us know, you know, how we can help you. And before we go, um, we just want to give our guests, if anyone is interested in connecting with you, is there a way that people can can connect with you? For sure, for sure. So I appreciate, you know, all the kind compliments and things. And I, it's going to be a lot of support that we're going to need. So I'm learning how to ask for support. You know, that's mm-hmm. one of the things about being a woman. you got to ask for help sometimes. So I want to make sure that we are available and accessible to be able to reach people um, if they have any questions, because we are going to lead this thing off and bring people along the way. You know, we did a social equity raise and that was not easy. (laughs) (laughs) So um, you can reach us at newerlabs.com or you can reach us at our social media site right now. Our website is going up, so it will be at N-O-O-H-R-A-L-A-B-S.com. Um, we are getting everything worked out to be able to have that site available for people to come and see and visit our site to see what type of brands we're going to be making. But then also on our social media handles is at N-O-O-H-R-A-L-A-B-S. Awesome. Instagram. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time no today. Worries. We'll look forward to talking soon. Thank well, you, thank Nicole. Thank you. It was an honor. Thank you so much. Right. Take care of yourself. So our next guest today is Danny Walton. She is the CEO of Agris Farms, as well as the co-founder and CMO of Next Level Delivery, a cannabis delivery service in the Bay Area of California. Danny, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's awesome How to you meet you, Danny. Thank you. Yeah, Danny is definitely an OG. And I, I consider her a personal <laughs> friend. It's so great to see you. It's been so, so long. I cannot wait to be together in person again. Um, Maybe you could start out by telling us a little bit about your journey in the space. I know that you're a true OG in every sense of the word. Um, <laughs> so if you could just let us know how you got to today, we'd love to hear about it. Yeah. Um, so first and foremost, I guess my what got me into cannabis is that um, I deal with a lot of chronic pain issues. I have fibromyalgia um, and I have Cushing's. So for me, when I was younger and going through my diagnosis, um, cannabis is really what helped me get off of all my medications. 
for me, cannabis has kind of always been there. My family, I come from cannabis. My, my parents used to grow. Um, they still use cannabis to this day. And for me, I wanted to make this more of a profession. So when I was 22, I decided to apply at Harborside. And I started there um, as a bud tender and worked my way up to being Steve D'Angelo's executive assistant. I was there for about 12 years in total. Uh, I was Steve's right hand for about nine of those 12 years. And then the other half, I ran wholesale for their farm as well as brand development for their brand key. Um, and then after, I guess it was 12 years, me and a couple of the other uh, females that had been there for forever, Adrian and Infinity, we decided that it was kind of our time to make the jump and um, start our own delivery. So we, uh, when the time came that we found out there was a license available, we jumped on it and that was next level delivery. Also from that time, um, my relationship with Agris was growing. Um, Harborside and Agris and Airfield were all supposed to merge at one point. Um, and while they were all doing negotiations, I was running the wholesale for a lot of their, you know, for their farms. So it became natural for me to just step up to be the CEO of Agris once I left Harborside. Um, and I still run all the day-to-day -day sales and, and all of that and uh, have a whole amazing team that runs all the operations. So I'm really blessed, but um, it's been a journey and it's been about 13 years in this industry and kind of done everything from bud tending to um, reception to, you know, inventory and kind of everything up in between. <laughs> so. We've talked to a few other people who, you know, have similar experience where when you start as a bud tender, you really, you know, see every step of the way and you really learn about the plant yeah. and you have a direct line to the consumer um, and everything. I think it's interesting, though, to have a a role now that's, you know, both on the, the farm side of things and also, you know, the delivery side. So consumer facing. So what are the, you know, greatest things that you like about being on both sides, I guess? Uh, well, for me, um, you know, being at Harbor Side, I was able to still be on both sides. I was able to work with retail and supply chain, um, you know, when I wasn't Steve's assistant, and then also work with their cultivation. So I would go back and forth from Oakland to Salinas most of the week. Uh, for me, that is what I love. I love retail and I love cultivation. Um, so to be able to now have both my own companies in that way of running one company and then owning my own delivery uh, with a few others, it really has, um, and it's like a dream come true for me in that way that I'm able to, I was able to create the, the career that I really wanted in both sectors. So I feel really lucky. Dreams come true if you make them come true, right? <laughs> yeah, a lot of hard work, a lot of hard work, sleepless nights, um, fights with the, you know, the federal government with Harborside. And um, when we were going through that, I was Steve's assistant. And so, again, there was like no sleeping. <laughs> we were we were fighting a lot of the time just to stay open. Um, so I feel like I've kind of been lucky in that way that I was able to be by the right hand of someone who um, kind of like the grandfather of cannabis. <laughs> That's what I call right. grandfather yeah, Steve. <laughs> Papa Steve. You know, it's and it's incredible because in a market like California, there have been so many changes, right, in the time that you've been a part of this industry. And that must have been really remarkable for you to kind of see the transformation between, you know, 215, 64, you know, and that whole um, transformation. What was that like for you? Uh, a roller coaster. Um, still a roller coaster. I feel like we're still dealing with um, 64 issues and trying to fix those because, um, you know, it's not perfect. But uh, yeah, like I said, it's just been, I feel like I've always been in battle in this industry. Um, and where I have never felt that way in any other industry, we're always fighting, um, whether it was back in the 215 days uh, to even now, it's just more regulated now. And trying to change the regulations so that they fix fit, sorry, um, our industry just a little bit better. Since you have so much history looking back, I guess, what would be your ideal vision for the future of the cannabis industry, either in general or in California? You know, if you, um, could, if you could pick your future, you know, and how it looks. Banking. <laughs> it's really definitely something that I hope is simple. in the near future. <laughs> uh, very, very simple. Um, I feel like that is, uh, everyone is, you know, has, I feel like on both sides of whether federal legalization is going to be good for the industry or not. Um, I feel like there's going to be pros and cons each way we go. 
Uh, so for me, the biggest part is is getting that banking, which is going to come with federal legalization, even though yes. I know that that's going to open up the floodgates for all of these other big companies to now join in the industry, which is the other downfall of it going federally mm-hmm. legal. Um, however, I feel like once we're able to go federally legal, then interstate trans- um, transport opens up. And California being the craft state and being so known for its cannabis, I feel like is it this it's we're gonna be able to provide the rest of the United States with the quality cannabis that they also deserve, I feel like is gonna be exciting for California. Um but again, it's for me it's mainly it's banking. Right now, having no access to banking is probably yes. the hardest thing being a business owner, as well as just financing, um, getting investment. Yes, it's easy to go out there and get investors in the space, but it'd be nice to be able to go to a bank and get a loan for the business and not have to pay such, uh, you know, a high interest rate with an investor or have to give up equity in the business. I guess what I'm interested in, Danny, is that you've had this, you know, extreme roller coaster, but how has um, being a female in the space um, affected that journey? Have there been more challenges? Uh, definitely been more t- challenges on just making sure that I'm heard in a way and taken seriously, just like the other male counterparts in the room. Mm-hmm. Um, lucky enough, though, Steve has always been a huge activist and feminist on that way. His mom was a feminist. Um, he's so he's always supported females if, at Harborside. Um, I don't know how it is now, but back when I was there, it was primarily females and manager or in management. And a lot of the C-class executives, there were females. So it was nice to be able to be in a place where I felt like I could grow. Um, And I was given the push by him to actually make my own way, um, where I feel lucky, where maybe not everyone in the industry has had that. Um, So Harborside was really great in that way, that they put a lot of females and a lot of females of color. There's diversity. It was great. Um, And I feel lucky to be a part of that. Because That's, I was molded and trained and, and pushed to be an executive uh, by Steve. So very that, thing. That is something to celebrate about, yeah. you know, him as an ev- individual, but also as an organization to see that because that's how opportunities are created. And that's mm-hmm. how, you know, people can can move up like you did. So way to congrats yeah. on you for taking the opportunity, though, because that is half the battle is, you know, moving forward with it. Yeah. And you have to be, I mean, you have to be a hustler and you have to want it too. It's, you can't just be on the sideline either. Like I made sure my voice was heard in meetings. I made sure like my opinion was at the table along with all the executive males. So it's really important to speak up. What advice would you have for um, women in the cannabis industry? You talk about being a hustler and um, making sure your voice is heard, but what other advice do you have for women in this industry? Uh, Stay strong. Um, It's a tough industry, but there's more females out there and there's going to be more females and C-level positions out there in this industry than any other industry. You just have to kind of strap on the roller coaster, ride the wave, um, but be strong. And don't give up is my best advice. Uh, This industry, like I said, uh, can have its ups and downs and with regulations and with taxes, uh, it can be hard. And so I feel like everyone just needs to stay strong, stay positive, uh, and we'll all get through this, especially with the help of others. Yeah, that's really important. And something I think that us women need to remind ourselves in the cannabis Mm -hmm. industry is that we have each other we have the support system and we have to remind ourselves even though we don't know that we exist like we can rely (laughs) on instagram on linkedin like we have each other and uh um we're here to for a common cause so exactly clubhouse has been great with that too yes you're able to really get into rooms with other females in this industry especially just around the united states uh, and get to know others that are making moves in other states that you may not be watching. Mm-hmm. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, to learn from each other across state lines, across country mm-hmm. lines. Because I work with Bovida's international customers, yep. and I can tell you, everyone wants to hear about Northern California and the international world. So it's valuable to hear from across yeah. the pond. Sure. And find a mentor. Uh, I feel like being an entrepreneur, the best thing that I could have had is having good mentors. Yes. Yeah. People who have been through what you've been or you're about to go through (laughs) uh, is very helpful because they can help guide you. You've got great advice. 
Yeah. Great <laughs> advice, Danny. Well, I'm looking forward to the day when we can all be together. And uh, Danny, I heard, uh, did a little research on you, and I saw that you're big into the Jeep community, and we have that in common. So we might have to tow a Jeep out to California and Oh yeah, so no a territory Jeep over here, Danny. <laughs> on my days off, I am I'm either off roading um, or my husband and I are at the beach. So uh, off roading for me is my like de stressor, my second passion. I just love getting out there. So awesome, and that's, that's important too. Anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> having having something outside of cannabis is is important too to, oh, God, yeah. to unwind. Yeah, you you need to have your outlets to uh, take out your stress. Going over rocks is a great one. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, loving riding in that Jeep when we went up to uh, Meadowlands <laughs> that time. I was like, this thing oh, is yeah. super slick. It's like you can live out of that thing. Yeah, and I've lifted it and I've got bigger tires now, um, more suspension. So uh, hopefully we'll have another Meadowlands soon. Because gosh, uh, the last one I was injured at and I'd like to re re uh, redo. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I forgot about that. And it was like a whole camping like weekend. And so, yeah, yeah you, you poor thing. Oh, my gosh. I forgot about that part. Oh, we had so much fun, though, anyway. Yeah. Hopefully events will happen soon. So absolutely. Yeah, we'll out. <laughs> Fingers we're, crossed. We're all looking forward to it. Right. Thank you so much for being on today, Danny. It was great to learn from you. You have great advice, you know, from your time in the industry. I learned and I felt inspired by your your advice to, you know, hear put my voice out at the table and you know, put yourself out there for opportunities. So thank you so much. Uh, any of our listeners want to reach out and connect with you or your company, how can they do so? Uh, you can reach out to me on Instagram at dabbing for wellness. And that's F O R not the number four. Um, or you can email me at Dani D A N I at agris farms, a G R I S farms, F A R M S.com. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.